Welcome to the Elvis Presley channel. Elvis didn't have much money growing up, but what his family lacked in wealth, they made up for in love. Elvis received so much love from his parents, it was one of the few constants in his life as they moved a lot while he was growing up. With a doting mother who tried too much to shield him from the world, Elvis grew up introverted and didn't have many friends. However, for someone who grew up being sweet and average, Elvis stuck out like a sore thumb and attracted the attention of bullies. Why Elvis Presley's family wished to be poor again. Make sure to watch the video until the end, and if you are new here, don't forget to join our wonderful community by subscribing to the channel. With his luxuriously groomed hair and sideburns, hypnotic easy smile, Elvis stole the minds of many people, and up until now, his music still resonates with many. Elvis grew up as a twinless twin, as his twin brother was still born. This made him an introvert as his mother tried to shield him from everything. To put it in context, Elvis dashed back home after getting overwhelmed by the 1600 students in Humes. Elvis and Gladys had a great relationship, and as Priscilla said, Elvis's mum was his one true love. Elvis would say when his mum died, it broke my heart. She was always my best girl. A relationship between mother and son is normal, but Elvis and his ma had a fiercer bond than most sons would have with their mums. Elvis cried his eyes out when she died and was inconsolable. In the middle of tears, the king said, Goodbye, darling, we loved you. Oh, God, everything I have is gone. I lived my life for you. I loved you so much. And it was true. The two songs that began Elvis Presley's explosion as an artiste, he sang for his mother. He sang the two songs as he left high school, and they were birthday gifts for his mum. The death of his mum was as a result of his fame. The two birthday songs he gave his mum created a path to stardom for him, and his mother couldn't cope. She was far too rustic for the attention that her son got as a superstar. Gladys loved to feed the chickens in front of their Graceland home, or wash outside to the jeers of her neighbours. Gladys preferred their life when they were poor, and she said it at different times that she wished they could go back to being poor. To deal with the attention that came with fame, she turned to drinking, and soon had hepatitis. She later died of a heart attack and liver damage from alcohol poisoning. She died shortly after Elvis returned from Germany, as he was serving in the United States Army at the time. Elvis loved his mum, and it was one of the reasons he reportedly married Priscilla, who he met in Germany. Elvis believed his wife had some things in common with his mum, and he saw his mum in her. However, the two would later divorce with their marriage lasting six years. After his first single, That's All Right, caused quite the ruckus in the summer of 1954, Elvis would go on to make an album with RCA in 1956, and would soon go on to get his first certified gold record with Heartbreak Hotel. This success got Elvis more TV time, which led to the performance of Hound Dog, and the introduction to the world of the scintillating hip-thrusting of Elvis. That performance generated quite the controversy, and Elvis isn't a stranger to controversy. However, these controversies didn't affect his success, as he sold over a billion records. The American sweetheart Elvis Aaron Presley was born in a time when there was little sweetness in America. He was born to Gladys and Vernon Presley on January 8, 1935. His birth was a mix of sadness and joy, as his twin brother Jesse Garron who his mother gave birth to earlier, was a stillbirth. That single unfortunate event would lead his mother to begin viciously overprotecting Elvis. Elvis's parents were so poor they used their welfare funds to pay the $15 the doctor charged for helping to birth Elvis in his parents' self-built two-bedroom shotgun shack. OK, not completely self-built, as Elvis's uncle, Vesta Presley, and grandfather, Jesse Presley, helped. Now don't go thinking, hey, a two-bedroom apartment is big enough. The Presley home isn't, and Elvis would later say himself, you can take this birthplace and put it in my living room at Graceland. 
Elvis's parents were steeped in poverty that they had to rely on donations to raise their son. Thankfully, they lived among clusters of family members and friends who wanted to help. In 1938, Elvis and his parents lost their Tupelo shotgun shack as they couldn't keep up with their home's repayment plan. Sadly, they lost their home because Vernon Presley, Elvis's father, went to jail on account of forgery. You see, in 1937, Vernon and his brother-in-law, Travis Smith, had some run-ins with the law because of forgery. Vernon had sold a hog to one of the wealthier men of Tupelo, Orville S. Bean, who paid Vernon four dollars for the hog. Now Vernon felt that hog should be worth more, and he grumbled to Travis and one other friend of theirs. Three men and grumbling over a perceived injustice rarely ever goes well. They decided Vernon could do something about it by manipulating the figures on the cheque to make the figure higher. Vernon needed the money, so it sounded like the gospel to his ears. They manipulated the figures, but overestimated their intelligence. Banks, ready for this, swiftly caught Vernon and his gang and handed them over to the police. Vernon didn't make bail and cooled his heels in custody for about six months, and he was eventually tried and jailed in 1938 for three years. Shortly after, his wife and his child had to move with relatives. However, there are some discrepancies on the relatives they chose to live with. In his book Last Train to Memphis, Peter Garalnik claimed Elvis and his ma moved in with Jesse, who lived in a relatively more spacious four-bedroom apartment next door. Peter claimed they remained there till Vernon got out of jail. Elaine Dundee and her work wrote something different, not entirely different from Peter, yet different. Elaine wrote, These are hard times for mother and son, understandably in view of Jesse Presley's attitude towards his son. Gladys had grown more and more uncomfortable living next door to her father-in-law. At some point during Vernon's prison sentence, Gladys moved out and stayed with her first cousin, Frank Richards. So, Gladys and Elvis did live with Elvis's grandpa, but due to her discomfort around him, it would seem as if they later went on to live with Gladys's relatives. This tracks, as some sources claim Vernon, spent that long in custody and didn't make bail because his father didn't stand as surety for Vernon. Some say Jesse Presley did boot Vernon from his home when he was 16. Jail wasn't enough to break the bond between the Presleys. Elvis would bawl about missing his dad, and Gladys ensured they visited him regularly in the slammer. Vernon would come back from prison in 1939, earlier than what should have been his prison term. Vernon owes this to the people of his community who petitioned, and Mr. Orville S. Bean, who wrote a letter that favoured Vernon. When Vernon returned, life wasn't any easier, as he took up work as a labourer, with him and his family moving around, not staying in a place for long. With their moving about, they remained faithful members of the Assembly of God Church. It was where Vernon met Gladys, and the two had agreed to continue attending the church. It was that church that stoked the flame that would later become the ravaging fire that would become the hip-thrusting Elvis. Elvis, at the tender age of four, understood their situation, and one time, when he overheard his parents talking about bills, Little Elvis, God bless his heart, revealed his grand plans for his parents. He told his mum, Don't you worry none, baby. When I grow up, I'm going to buy you a fine house and pay everything you owe at the grocery store and get two Cadillacs, one for you and Daddy and one for me. This became a recurring thing for him as he grew up. When Elvis began his education in 1941 at the East Tupelo Consolidated School Lake Street, his teacher described him as sweet and average. Little did she know that she was in the presence of a future music god. At this point, due to his introverted upbringing, Elvis was a shy kid, and his folks did try to give him a sibling. Sadly, Gladys suffered a miscarriage and accepted Elvis would be her only child, and became even fiercely protective of him. In 1945, Elvis and his parents moved into a relatively larger house, the interesting part of this is that Vernon brought the house from Orville S. Bean. Remember Mr. Bean? He was the same man Vernon forged his cheque and landed in jail for said forgery. Apart from moving to a larger house, Elvis began to come into himself, even if slightly. 
his class got a taste of the man who would become a future superstar. Elvis's talent as would-be superstar began what would have been an ordinary day if not for Elvis's rich voice piercing the classroom air. His homeroom teacher, Mrs Grimes, had offered students the opportunity to pray for the class. Elvis got up and wowed the class with an angelic rendition of Old Shep. No one expected such a powerful performance from a ten-year-old fifth grader. Now Mrs Grimes had a reputation for being as tough as nails, and for her to be impressed meant something. Mrs Grimes would reveal to Elaine Dundee the extent of how much that performance touched her. He sang it so sweetly, Mrs Grimes said. Grimes would then take shy Elvis to meet the school principal, Mr Cole, and asked Elvis to sing that same song. Elvis sang Old Shep, and Elvis's voice carried him away to the extent that he ensured Elvis entered the Mississippi-Alabama Fair and Dairy Show. He was one of the younger contestants of the Fair and Dairy Show, and he wasn't even tall enough to reach the microphone. Standing on a chair, Elvis, as confident as he could, handled the microphone and put everything into singing Old Shep, which earned him fifth place. After such an outstanding achievement, Elvis would go on one of the rides in the fair, which his mother called dangerous. His mum whipped him as he gave her quite the scare. Well, nothing happened to Elvis, but Gladys always thought she could prevent all sorts of harm from falling on her sweet boy. When Elvis clocked eleven in 1946, he got a guitar from his mum as a birthday gift after much persuasion. Some say the guitar was a substitute for what Elvis originally wanted, a bicycle. Gladys, Elvis's mum, reportedly wasn't too keen on the prospect of her boy falling and injuring himself on a bicycle. Another version claimed Elvis wanted a rifle, and the thoughts of what a rifle could do scared Elvis's mum witless. Although with Elvis reportedly owning 32 handguns, a machine gun and a shotgun, there may be some credence to such claims. Gun or bike, one thing is certain, the sensational singer got a guitar. Elvis got some guitar lessons from a local pastor, and he began to lose some of his shyness, but not quickly enough to avoid the slim incident. One of the drawbacks of Elvis's upbringing as an introverted lonely boy had bouts of stage fright he had when he was younger. One of the more prominent reports of stage fright was when Mississippi Slim let Elvis sing but Elvis faltered. You see, Slim was a big deal for Elvis, a hero, if put more precisely. Slim was passionate about music, and as Slim's younger brother, James Osborne, said, he was crazy about music, that's all he talked about. So for Slim to recognise the talent of the then 12-year-old Elvis is nothing short of how talented Elvis was. However, Elvis is no coward. After the first time stage fright, Elvis went the following week, and Slim backed him up. Elvis and his parents later moved to Memphis when he was in the eighth grade, and he gave his classmates at Millam Junior High a farewell performance for 30 minutes. He sang Leaf on a Tree for them. This was a turnaround from how some of his junior high peers and students viewed his music as hillbilly in the seventh grade. At Memphis, life didn't get easier, as Elvis's parents had to apply for an apartment at Lauderdale Courts. The Courts was a public housing complex that marked a turnaround for Elvis. He made many friends in the complex, and completely reinvented himself in school. Elvis the quiet boy became bodacious with his fashion style. He began to rock fashion elements, like dress pants with flashy side stripes. After wearing those lovely dress pants, he would pair them with bolero jackets and began to grow out his sideburns and longer hair. Elvis dressed in the flashiest clothes and stood out, as everyone wore drab clothes in comparison. Oh, don't let us forget his flashy scarves! He made both friends and enemies with his now flashy nature. His friends were largely people like him, young folks interested in music, and did Memphis have many of those? The fact that they had the Ellis Auditorium, where different artists came to perform acts, there were jazz practitioners, blues singers, and notable gospel groups. 
When they could listen to live shows, the famous DJ Dewey Phillips of WHBQ played blues and R&B. King at WDIA played different kinds of blues, and at WHHM Radio, country music flowed ceaselessly. Elvis continued to play his guitar and has made a positive impression on his classmates. As much as some loved him for being daring, others viewed him as different and bullied him. They cut his guitar strings at one point, but they didn't stay cut for long as his classmates all contributed to buying him a set of strings. The finances of the Presleys didn't get any better, and they picked up some odd jobs. He began better with the guitar, played in a band, and even had a girlfriend. By 1952, Elvis and his parents moved yet again to another apartment, as their total earnings became higher than what was allowed to stay in Lauderdale Courts. However, they were near the courts, so Elvis didn't need to find new friends. From being protected by his mum, Elvis, through his talent, had friends and connected with the hearts of many. While his parents didn't have money, they showered him with love, which he infused into his music. The death of Elvis's mum changed him. He had a reckless life filled with drugs, like most musical artists of his time. Elvis relied heavily on opiates, sedatives and barbiturates, but he never indulged in alcohol too much. The drugs led to the end of this entertainment king as he had a heart attack and overdosed on several drugs. Despite his flaws, Priscilla, the only woman he married, said, He was an amazing human being, was generous, a caring person, he was loyal. I don't know one person who does not like Elvis Presley. Not one person. Elvis's mother had become overprotective of her son, but as our video made it clear, Gladys had a good explanation. Did Elvis Presley have a twin brother? Watch this video and find out the details about Elvis's personal life. <laughs> 